So I will uh, give sort of a version of what Rafe just presented, but this will be a lot closer to home. So this will also begin to give you some insights into the types of species that we'll see while we're in Corrup, since there's quite a few of you here that are um, interested in amphibians and reptiles. Uh, and hopefully the rest of you will at least get a sense of you know, what we're going to see. But before I do that, I want to actually just give just a few other comments that kind of pertain to my introduction real quick. And it kind of also pertains to the goals of doing these field sampling efforts that I'm going to talk about. And so, first of all, I mean, for all of us that are interested in Africa, this is an enormous place, right? It's a really hard place to have thorough inventories of any site. We might have them for one or two sites, but we have an enormous continent to be concerned with, right? And just like groups of people go across international boundaries, so does the fauna, so does the flora, right? And so the surface of the moon is 38 million square kilometers. The surface of continental Africa is 30 million square kilometers, right? It's not that much smaller than the surface of the moon. And so we have this enormous area to, to work with. And so w across continental Africa, we're studying biodiversity in this very quickly growing human landscape. And so these are the projections for the United Nations for uh, large cities by 2030. Right, so Lagos is projected to be at least 10 million or more by 2030. This is Kinshasa, um, this is Luanda, this is Dar. But even within the landscape, you know, in a much smaller landscape of Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, I mean, there's going to be many cities of 5 million people in those countries. Right? And Lagos occurs right in one of the recognized biodiversity hotspots, the Lower Ghanaian Forest Zone, and we're in the Lower Ghanaian Forest Zone right now. So we're going to have these immense human populations putting pressure on these biodiversity hotspots. And so you know, now is the time to do these inventories before you know, we start losing these landscapes uh, even more so than we've already left, lost them now. This is also a really exciting time because we now have all of you participating, right? And, and me and you participating. So this is a picture from the first African amphibian working group in the early 1970s. And what you'll notice is that these are all mostly men, mostly white, and mostly European. I think we have one South African in this. And pretty much everyone at that time that was working on biodiversity in Africa, at least for amphibians, came from outside of Africa, right? And so this is the African amphibian working group meeting from May of last year. You can see that it looks really different. And so now, you know, in this, in this training group that we had in, um, in Uganda, we have people like Toby, who's coming from Gabon. He's actually Cameroonian, but is now in Gabon. Daniel, who works for the National Parks in Rwanda. We have a number of people that are here working for WCS. People from Congo, Matias from Uganda. This is a really diverse group, right? And this is great. This is exactly the type of networks that we want to build up to start studying biodiversity on this truly grand scale. And just to give you an idea of you know, how this plays into my own work, this is just for two genera of frogs that I work on. We'll see both of these in the field, Arthroleptus, which are little brown frogs, Cardioglossa, which kind of look like poison dart frogs. They're very colorful. Cameroon is really the center of their diversity. The point is not to talk about these frogs. It's just that for these two genera, when we're trying to sample and understand biodiversity, understand patterns of species diversity, where are the species found, how far you know, do they occur across Africa, we now have projects where we can have sampling for 24, 25 countries just for, just for tissue samples, not alone you know, the vouchers that are in museum collections. We can have tissue samples for 25 countries to study a single genus. And that's because we have these big collaborative networks that are made up of all of these people working outside of Africa, inside of Africa. So in the 15 years that I've been coming to Africa, it's really transformed from when I first started as a grad student, there was really not that many people for me to work closely with, and now there's many, and many here. Uh, so it's a really, for me personally, it's a really exciting time to be here. So the, the goal is just to give you a sense when I go out and do field studies. For me, for the most part, I'm not doing inventories of particular sites because what we're trying to do is generate a lot of samples of different species that we can then start um, using those samples to understand things like you know, new des descriptions of new species, understanding <coughs> relationships among species. We're interested in patterns within species. You know, how does a single species vary across geographic space? How does it vary across habitat types? And, and also, I think this is really fundamental, and this will come up um, in the pictures that we have, in the videos that Rafe showed, 
is that for so many of these species, even the named ones, all we know is that they exist, right? They have a name, they exist, that's it. We don't know anything more about their biology. We don't know what type of tadpoles they have, how long do they live, what do they eat, what do they look like in life. In many cases, we only know of them from dead museum specimens. We have no idea what color they are. So having this sort of basic documentation that we do when we're going to corrupt is really fundamental to understanding biodiversity, not only in terms of you know, how many species occur in one site, but all these other aspects of biology of those species. Uh, so me, personally, since I'm mostly interested in amphibians, we work in the rainy season, either at the very beginning of it or even just during the rainy season. In the real heart of the dry season, sometimes it's very hard to find amphibians. That's when we would focus more on reptile species. Uh, and one of the things that kind of came up that Town mentioned earlier is that for many species, even though we know that they exist, even though there's many previous records of them, we really need new resources for those species to understand all these other th questions, right? Understand how species are related to each other based on genetics. To do that, we need tissue samples of those, spe of those species, right? So that's why we're going out and getting new, new collections of these species, even those that we already know about. And, you know, maybe at the most basic level, if we're interested in patterns of biodiversity across Africa, you know, all of these sampling events that we have in, um, in my field work, those pieces are really necessary to know how broadly these species uh, range across Africa. So just in the last 10 years, this is just places that I've worked um, across Africa. And so this is what we were talking about Malawi earlier. I last was in Malawi 10 years ago. And the reason that we work across this landscape, and I have colleagues that work in Congo, is because we're really interested in knowing, is the species we find here in Cameroon, is that actually the same one we find in Uganda or not? You know, we don't really know. In a lot of cases, they're difficult to tell apart, so we want to go to those countries and get genetic resources for them. Uh, we want to make calls of those species so we can really begin to understand, you know, is it really the same species that across occurs across these entire uh, large landscapes. And so just to give you a few examples today, I'm going to focus um, on work that we did in uh, 2013. And most of that was around this green spot here. This is the Jaw Forest Reserve. It's a World Heritage Site. So um, most of what I'll show you is from this western edge right here. This is near the town of Sang Malima, where the president of Cameroon is from, Paul Boya. And just for reference, this is where we are. Uh, we flew into Douala. Those of you that came internationally, that's that white dot here and we're over here in Boya. And we're going to go up into this green spot here. And so the fauna is actually quite different um, between here and here, even though it's in Cameroon. Uh, the richness of species is actually very different. It's, it's much less diverse uh, sometimes over here on the eastern side of Cameroon. So to get to these sites involves a lot of driving, right, along uh, roads that are not necessarily very good roads. We're lucky in this particular case, this road is not a road that's used by logging trucks because they can't get to this site, and I'll show you why in a moment. Uh, but a lot of the other areas where logging trucks can get to in southern Cameroon, the forest is not always as nice uh, because those forests are you know, subject to extraction. Their large, large timber is coming out of those, those forests. And so it takes us a while to get to those sites. But when we do go, we try now to bring in uh, teams of a lot of different people. So Marcel is a Cameroonian grad student that works with me. He's actually in San Francisco right now. Divine, who some of you will meet, is someone who I've worked with for 11 years here. And then Greg, Dan, and Becca are American grad students that came with me. And what will happen, uh, you know, you saw it in Rafe's work. You'll see it in my photos today and tomorrow, is that it's really necessary to have these larger teams of people simply to do the types of sampling of each specimen that we want to do. When we say that we want to take a tissue sample, a photograph, we want to swab it for a disease, we want to take a blood sample, it's a lot of stuff to do, right? So we really need a lot of hands to process these specimens. We really work as a team when we prepare specimens. So, you know, the fundamental things that are important to getting out there and doing this type of work are good field vehicles and also very good drivers. Um, we cart in a lot of our tables and chairs when we do this work. Uh, one thing that comes in handy are shovels, and the, we actually had these with us because we collect Sicilians, which I'll show you later. Uh, so this is, um, they, they work just as well for digging out field vehicles uh, as they do for digging up Sicilians. They're probably more effective at that. So sometimes some of these sites are very difficult to access. So this is the Ja River. This is, <laughs> the road ends and then the road begins here. Um, this was a surprise to me when I got to this site. I didn't realize that there wasn't a way to get across the river. And so this right here is a barge 
and this barge has no motor in it. So the way that you get the barge is you pull it across the river and then you float the other way. Right? So we were able to load uh, two vehicles onto this barge and then the current basically pulls us across and we can also ratchet our way across using these ropes that are out of the picture here. So it's not always easy to get to uh, places. And as Town mentioned, there's a lot of manual labor that goes into the science. So mostly uh, we're at some of these sites where we're near small villages. This is a pygmy village that's a, or a Baca village that's in the southern part of Cameroon. And we're setting up camp um, you know, near or outside of these villages. This is just what one of our campsites look like, setting up a lot of tents. Uh, other parts that, you know, as both Mark and Town mentioned, is having some sort of dedicated prep area. So we have a prep tent that we'll bring with us uh, into the field here uh, in Corrupt. This is looking the opposite direction. We also have a dedicated kitchen area. So we try and space out the prep tents and the sleeping tents and the kitchen tents uh, away from one another. This is the prep tent and um, I'll, I'll tell you more about for us what goes inside these prep tents and what's happening in here tomorrow. Uh, Rafe already kind of gave you an introduction to a lot of what happens inside the prep tents, but we'll go through that in much more detail tomorrow. But we found it really useful to have these dedicated preparation spaces. Um, our kitchen tent and just, you know, there's a lot of basic functions that you just have to remember to bring with you in the field. So I mean, we always try and pack multiple tarps uh, because sometimes you can't find palm fronds and things like that, as well as, you know, dedicated kitchen gear. And sometimes it's these details that are easy to forget about, but they really are critical to making sure that life happens wherever you go. So uh, when we go out in the field to do surveys, we're working in forests like this. This is, some, um, this is right on the edge of secondary and primary forest in Jaw Reserve. And we do spend a lot of our time going out at night as herpetologists, as Rafe mentioned. That's when a lot of these species are active. But we also spend time, as much as we can, get away from preparing specimens going out during the day. Uh, because you do see things, a lot of reptiles are active during the day. Um, we also use it as a time for sampling inside streams and inside swamps uh, and inside ponds that in many ways are just easier for us to work in during the day. We can see things better during the day. Uh, it's a great time for us to go out and collect tadpoles. Uh, so focus on these other types of life history during the day. But a lot, of, a lot of what we do is at night. So this is just for those of you that aren't herpetologists to give you some sense of what that's like. And so this is just me using a, a headlamp looking around inside a swamp. Those are all hyperoleus frogs that are calling. These are the very gaudy, uh, brightly colored or reed frogs that you see around Africa. And we spend most of our time doing this, looking, looking for things like that, um, which is a little hyperoleus male calling. It's out of focus because I'm walking in mud and grabbing them, right? And so that's what a lot of our work is like at night, is doing that basic stuff again and again and again for many hours at night. Uh, as well as, you know, taking video and calls um, and photographs, as Rafe mentioned, of these frogs and of lizards and snakes, if we see them, you know, out at night doing what they do. It's also, uh, in, in Africa, the primary time when we collect chameleons. As probably many of you know, chameleons are very difficult to actually see in the day, right? Um, they also, not only are they hard to see, they also are behavior, they sort of behaviorally are hard to see. They hide during the days. And so the reason they're easy to find at night is they don't really do any sort of color matching to their environment. And they also sit at the ends of long branches. And so you can find ferns and branches that are just covered with chameleons. This, I think, Walter, is from Oku, where there's a famous spot that's covered in little ferns and it's just, there's chameleons on like every single fern. And so for those, just to remind all of you, because I hope that we'll be bringing chameleons into camp, I'll talk about snakes in a moment, but chameleons, oh, oh no. Maybe it's coming later. Chameleons aren't dangerous, right? So there's a, throughout Africa, people are deathly afraid of chameleons. Chameleons are not going to hurt you. We will hopefully have some chameleons in camp. They're actually very uh, unoffensive animals. They will try and bite you, but they're not going to do anything if they bite you. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the type of diversity that we'd sample, uh, just in you know, spending four nights in the Ja Reserve, so we were able on four nights to come up with 31 species. Most of this, unsurprisingly, are frogs because that's what I study, so that's what we're spending a lot of our effort on. But also during the rainy season, the easiest thing to find are frogs, and so it becomes more difficult sometimes to find <laughs> lizards in those environments. But we were fortunate to have a lot of snakes, and I'll say more about that in a moment. And we have one, so you know, most of these are frogs, many different genera of frogs, a Sicilian 
uh, lizards, and then a number of snakes. So I'm just going to introduce you to some of these because some of these are the types of things that you're going to be seeing uh, while you're here. So Hemidaxilis, what's now called coalescens, used to be fasciatus. These are uh, good sized sort of medium to large sized geckos that live on sort of large trunks of trees in the forest. We have very small uh, leaf litter frogs that are little brown frogs like Arthroleptus, which I spent a lot of time on. Oh, here's the, here's the slide. Uh, I don't know why it came here. So we, we also find chameleons, and I just want to emphasize that chameleons are harmless. So for those of you that don't, have never experienced this, that are coming from outside, people are terribly afraid of chameleons. Uh, and these are little boys who you'd think would be braver than this, but these boys, you know, are like terrified that this chameleon is going to hurt them somehow. And as you can see, the chameleon is uh, very offensive here. It's just like clinging to a stick with dear life. Uh, so other things that we find, especially during the day, are a lot of leaf litter frogs. So Phrynobotrachus is very common throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, actually in the mountains in Cameroon, this genus seems to be in decline. We're also, uh, these are, there's beautiful lizards that we can see. Hopefully we'll find some Poromera. These are Lacertids. Uh, they, they have these really long, beautiful tails. This is a leaf litter frog, Cardioglossa, uh, which I mentioned before. These are really quite diverse in Cameroon. Uh, larger terrestrial frogs like Hyloranas. Uh, these very small skinks, sometimes we actually find these skinks when we're digging out uh, banks of streams looking for Sicilians. We can find these burrowed down under logs. Uh, we find them a lot of times when we're flipping rocks and logs near streams, these Panaspis. Uh, Xenopus, 